uh, with Uh, I think my recording kicked Don off. I didn't know I had powers like that. I'm sorry, guys. Um, yes, Caleb? I was going to say, let the record show that Don has left. <laughs> and let the record show he is back. Oh, back to you, Don. Uh, you'd think I'd have that done by now. Well, that was a little bit embarrassing, but not really. It's hard to embarrass old people, so anyway. I'm glad to introduce a little bit of humor into the evening here. Um, I am going to hang with you all and, and I wanted to actually share a screen for a moment here. I might have to be re, yes, I need to be um, given the powers again. Thank you guys. And there we go. And where did, okay, I've got to open. Try this again. All right, here we go. Okay, so wanted to, um, before we get into the, the real substance of the, the passage we're about to consider and the, the portion of the journey of the Israelites um, uh, out of Egypt, uh, wanted to uh, bring a little uh, geographical you know, kind of context here. Hopefully this will, will help in some important details, but, but not as important as the, yeah, the, the lessons and the, the, yeah, all the theological wonderful uh, things that are going on. So let me begin by making a comment about the number of people that uh, traveled uh, out of Egypt, the number of Israelites and the, um, the multitude is the word that's used as well of Egyptians that were like, we need to stay with God's people here and also exited Egypt. Uh, there's quite a, a, a disparity. So I want to just comment on that, that briefly. Um, Elif is the, uh, the Hebrew word that translates thousand. And so to make a, a longer story short, and glad to share details with people that are into this kind of thing. Uh, you can either translate, either is appropriate, though the majority is kind of run with the 600,000 plus women, and children were millions of people exiting Egypt or 600 troops consisting of 6,000 men plus women and children, prostitutes we're looking at maybe 30,000 is, is a guesstimate. That's a very, two very different numbers. I bring that up because um, I think you could, I, I think both numbers, I, I've, I've heard uh, scholars, you know, argue that both numbers are, are viable, uh, that they're, you know, they, they could be accurate. Um, I, I just bring that up because I'm slightly persuaded by the smaller number um, it doesn't uh, really impact the story. It's a detail, though, that, that as we try to wrap our minds around this, uh, what's going on here, 2 million, that's a lot of people, uh, 30,000, that's a lot less, though still a very large number of people. So just want to comment on that quickly. Wanted to also just kind of locate for you where Mount Sinai probably uh, was in, in this time. We got to remember that 3,000 year gap here. So we've got a, a story that's been passed down, passed down, passed down. And very carefully, uh, I'm not diminishing the, the kind of veracity of the text, but I, I wanna say that, that uh, things change in 3,000 years, including uh, you know, topography. So we've got bodies of water moving a bit. We've, you know, the shoreline is probably different from the Mediterranean Sea there. Um, one important feature, wanted to highlight here for a moment is the Red Sea is actually this massive body, if you know your geography, of water <coughs> separating uh, Egypt and Sudan and, and Saudi Arabia. At one point, it's 200 miles across. Um, at another deepest point, it's 10,000 uh, meters deep, I believe, just some crazy number. It's a massive, massive body of water. 
here's what I want to, and you go, what, how did that really, you know, and then they have the rabbit ears up there, uh, the Gulf of, of Aquaba and the Gulf, Gulf of Suez. So here's what uh, many, uh, you know, like where did they, what body of water did they cross? Where did that happen? And, and guesstimates usually land, you know, kind of up there uh, towards the top of the Gulf of Suez or maybe over here, you know, in the, so we just bottom line don't know, but there's a key uh, you know, two words that want to I just highlight for a moment. And again, if you're kind of into this, you, you might want to dig further. I spend a little too much time digging into maps and things because I like to, uh, but the, the actual translation there is not Red Sea, it's the Sea of Reeds. That's what the, the Hebrew scriptures um, record. Um, what happened, and we'll, we'll kind of zoom in. Uh, what happened is uh, in best guess about three, third century BC, uh, translation uh, from Hebrew uh, scriptures to into Greek, the Septuagint, uh, they translated for whatever reasons, uh, Red Sea, uh, the Latin Vulgate picked up on that. The English translations almost all follow Red Sea. It was actually the, the Sea of Reeds. And, and I think the some really good scholarship it will land the crossing of the, the Sea of Reeds in this area, um, kind of above the, uh, the Gulf of Suez. And again, the Gulf probably has moved a little bit. It was, there was more water almost certainly in this, what is now the Suez Canal, uh, a couple of lakes, and they probably crossed one of these lakes that were significant bodies of water. Um, I, I don't believe that they were just walking, you know, it wasn't really that miraculous. They were just were walking across a very large sandbar or something. I think, I think they were really walking across a significant body of water, but not the Red Sea. Okay, so just wanted to, to throw a a little bit of background there that might help you, <clears throat> especially if you're familiar with the geography and you're looking at the numbers and you're trying to enter into the story. All right, let me exit here for a moment. Um, okay. And wanted to provide also just a brief a comment, a little context before we get into the, actually before we compare notes a little bit. Um, sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with my, okay. Um, so in Israel's beginnings, we've seen that God uh, does not circumvent the fallen human race. Instead, he chooses people to call his own, um, saving them, adopting them, uh, calling them his treasured possession, uh, revealing himself to them, and not just in name, you know, his name Yahweh, but, but placing his very nature on display, his character, his glory, his power, uh, raising up individuals in the beginning of the redemptive arc through scriptures, uh, Abraham, Noah, Joseph, Genesis, right? And, and Moses, uh, certainly, um, uh, of course, and then even in the period of the judges, you have Gideon, Deborah, Samson, etc., raising up individuals to be uh, deliver God's people or to be kind of savior figures. So, so what what's going on there and why? We'll we'll get to that. Commissioning them, positioning them to save others, including those outside of even at that time Israel. That was the grander vision, right, for all nations, tribes, tongues. But that's not all that's going on in that first chapter of the redemptive story. Um, we are also seeing in the stories um, this wonderful kind of foreshadowing of the future, um, accessible metaphors, um, things that we can connect to and kind of understand and, and then work into, you know, kind of our grid into our world at this time. Templates, if you will, uh, of uh, and patterns uh, for those who uh, follow Jesus. Uh, the template of Exodus is the template or the pattern of the gospel. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Jesus more specifically um, shortly. Uh, but 
for, for a moment here, before we go back to the text itself, I want to uh, try this. I know that there's a, what is there, 20 some people on, so this might be a little tricky, but uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to contribute to this, the answer to this question. What condition were God's people in uh, it, when the Passover, very first Passover, right? And they were about to exit in a hurry uh, from Egypt. What kind of emotional state uh, were they in? What kind of spiritual state were they in? Obviously, this is uh, in some measure, you know, conjecture. We just kind of do our best. But here's, here's what's helpful, right, to remind ourselves of. And you see this in the scriptures. Uh, human beings are the same. We, we are made out of the same stuff. I see myself in Old Testament uh, characters all the time. I don't think human beings have changed really fundamentally at all. Um, the, the surroundings have changed and the experiences are different perhaps and similar in other ways. But, but I think we can relate and we can try to step into their you know, proverbial sandals and try to understand where they were at. And the reason that we're asking this question, right, is because not only to help us to enter into the story and to absorb it and to remember it, but also to go, and how would God meet a people in that condition, right? We're gonna be answering that question for the rest of the evening. But go ahead, um, you know the history, you've been, uh, you're familiar with enough of the story. There are some clues in the text in the first um, 11 chapters or so, you might wanna look there, but anyone wanna to contribute to that cause? We're trying to answer that question. It starts off. Um, one thing that struck me was chapter 12, verse 28, um, which is saying, then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Um, so it seems to me that at this point, they are putting their faith in Yahweh. Um, but then it's interesting because I know that later on, they during the exodus they're questioning moses they're questioning their faith um so it seems like kind of a wavering faith at this point um but as they're on the verge of the 10th plague and the exodus itself it seems like they're they're putting their faith in, in yahweh that's really good owen it, it is back and forth right and what is what have you been able to detect or any others that really were was turning, helping some really turn the corner faith-wise. Why was their faith increasing a bit, though, again, all over the place as well? I think uh, back to the plagues, like, even when God made these plagues happen, sometimes, like, the land of Goshen was not touched, um, and yep. the Egyptians were, um, God's people were protected in the midst of all this chaos, so that kind of showed them how awesome God was, how powerful he was, and how he would protect his people. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right, Bernadette. And it is almost the same, right, as if there's a, a flood all around in my city, but my house is completely unscathed and untouched. My neighbors are all kind of flooded out, and, and their houses are half destroyed, but I, we're not. I mean, just like, what's going on? And that happened repeatedly. So th there, there's the visual, and there's this experience of, like, look at these crazy things that are happening in the land and, and we seem to be protected somewhat so that was building their their faith in some measure absolutely what else yes Caleb. people gave them like a lot of gold and stuff and i also often have more faith after people give me a lot of valuable goods yeah that's good other other thoughts I think another point to add on to Owen's uh, note was that they were really faithful and hurried. Um, in chapter 12, verse 37, 
sorry, verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. So I'm just seeing like a picture of one, like carrying tons of gold and valuables that they plundered from the Egyptians, but two, just they have all that gold, but they don't even have leavened bread. Um, so it's just kind of a weird mix of, okay, whatever God said, they just did. Yeah, and, and smear lamb's blood, slaughter of lamb, smear it on your lamppost, cook the meat, right? Um, put your sandals on, get your staff ready, pack up. The, and I'm imagining, you know, kind of Rock is here on with a baby, but this included families with small children and, and old, you know, older folk. And, and so, so this crowd, uh, you know, this, the mass of people were, were just instantly like, we're going, we're out of here. And, and so that must have been a little bit stressful and, and more than a little bit chaotic. What about, uh, and again, this might be challenging for us, you know, some of us, of course, to, to really try to, to really imagine this. But this was the people that had been enslaved and their moms and dads and their grandparents and, you know, their aunt, uh, back a long way had been enslaved to the Egyptians. And it had been a, a pretty harsh um, uh, kind of experience over and all. The Egyptians took great advantage uh, of the Israelites, and there was abuse there. Um, there was uh, hard service work, um, and so what? What kind of what does that do to a person, right? If we can imagine, what kind of a you know, psychologically speaking, or, or you know, just emotionally, what kind of state were probably a majority of those people in? Uh, Don, I would probably say like um, just the sheer amount of time that the Israelites were in slavery gave them ample time to sort of develop an identity as enslaved people um, to sort of see their past and their future as, you know, the, the whatever's what, what is likely here is that their, their oppression would continue. And then you know, there is certainly like this outcry that kind of yeah. sparks this whole situation of people like crying out to be free. Um, but I still think it would just be like sort of in, immensely disorienting to be freed. Like I, I think about slaves in the United States, like, and how they were just sort of suddenly freed. And it, like to be freed from a condition that you've always been in is almost necessarily to enter into a kind of wilderness like you just don't know like there's a lot of unknowns about like how to prosper going forward like you get very familiar with how to get ahead in the system that is that's already established but then when the whole system breaks down you have to sort of learn an entirely new way of being um and so i could imagine that would be deeply disorienting that's so good. I, I think of the Shawshank Redemption. I know I'm dating myself a bit, but classic movie. Um, institutionalized, right? After after decades uh, behind bars in that small world, um, I think Red said, it kind of recognized the character of it, institutionalized and, and almost more comfortable, right? In in what's familiar, where you're known and you you know the the, the rules and the, the way, right? Uh, versus on the outside in the, the great unknown. So, so there must have been a combination of, of, of like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? Pinch myself. And, and also kind of it's terrifying a bit to leave all that was familiar, all that you had ever known, right? And, and to, to embark and, and head out. Um, this is all terrific. I'm going to space. I don't want to cut anyone off. Um, how am I seeing my to get out of there? Okay. Um, anyone else want to contribute before I we move on? Let me read a quick portion from from chapter five. When this is right after the, you know, uh, more bricks, last straw, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think the foreman is just going after Moses. May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. 
Moses returned to the Lord and said, this uh, man, talk about a, a access to, to God. And we're going to look at it. The, the nature of this relationship, Moses and God, and this conversation, listen to this conversation. Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Now, how's that for a, a raw um, and an honest, you know, kind of um, exchange with God? Um, the Lord answered there and, and reiterated the promises and what he was about to do and, and told Moses to report that back to the Israelites. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Um, so I, I think if there's a general, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, a majority of the people were, were I think, in, in spirit, right, pretty beaten down. And, and and pretty, you know, reticent and, and like to hope, right, in anything might seem like foolish or I just don't want to get my hopes up. But this is a beaten down people, which I think is a, a really important detail, especially when we reflect a little later on. So let's get the text. Before we go there, let me ask quickly, some of you all like to read and you're wonderful readers. Um, would you throw your name in the, the chat, like five people, maybe six people? Um, just put your name down so I can call on you to read different. And the, the text will come up on the screen so you don't have to look it up or anything. Um, and as long as you're staying with the call, you'll be able to read for us. Somebody like to read. Nobody likes to read. Oh, here we go. Awesome. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, wow, my glasses stink. Um, okay. So let's, uh, I'll share screen again. And um, sorry, I've got to pull it up again. Just one moment. We are going to dip into chapter 12. Okay, one moment. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, actually, let's go in order. I've lost my view of the chat. Oh, by the way, this painting, what I, I love about it is that not only it's just so well done, the, the color and all, but this is the the night, right, of um, at the at the uh, shoreline, uh, the nation of, of Israel, the Israelites hemmed in um, the, but there is a pillar of, uh, that we're going to read about here in, in a moment, that is bringing shadows and darkness to the Egyptians and, and the, the, the horde, the army that's, that's trying to devour and, and pursue the Israelites. And, but there's light on the other side in the evening. We're gonna read that in the text. And, and this kind of captures that. The, the people are illuminated as they're waiting and the, the winds are blowing and separating the seas um, all night long. Um, all right, I cannot see my chat, but please first, I think it was Ben, maybe first person up will go right in order from the chat for readers. So go for it. Great. Just stop me when it's uh, reached a point to stop. So go ahead and read the whole slide. Fantastic. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. For otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs, wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. 
Many other people went up with them and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. Awesome, thank you. We are not going to read um, all the texts. We're covering a couple of chapters, but just some highlights. And I'll, I'll just briefly comment on each and we'll, we'll work through the story and then we'll, we'll come back together. Um, the, the word plundered might throw us a little bit. In, and this is, there are a couple of words that you can translate plunder. Um, this one is really can be translated asked. And, and you see that in several portions in the, the passages where the, the, the Egyptians and, and one of the Psalms reflects on this were, were pitied. The, the Israelites because they were so abused and and they they literally asked I think the Egyptians for for uh, these treasures which God had promised in Genesis but also had been reiterated that promise and then of course we have the reference to the number um, many other people went mixed multitude is what it literally says there which is so encouraging to think that many, perhaps, who knows how many, the Egyptians were not on board with the Pharaoh's uh, kind of dogged determination to, to you know, uh, to crush the Israelites and, and many uh, left Egypt. Next passage and next reader, please. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Awesome. Thank you. A couple of quick notes. <clears throat> Um, consecrate every firstborn male. Don't have time to, to unpack that very much, but 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 essentially that's a, a comment that is saying that the Lord is is choosing for Himself a people and and uh, giving them all that they need. Really promises um, uh, deliverance, uh, you, you know, provision, all of that. Uh, but He's also expecting. Uh, a it's a reciprocal kind of, of thing and he requires of them to firstborn male uh, and animals and, and to consecrate or to set apart uh, firstborn males in, in that time were, were uh, had additional privileges given to them but also responsibilities so there was a role there for sure but but essentially the lord was saying give back to me it kind of like tithing right the first fruits give back to me the firstborn, uh, not to uh, necessarily require much more of them, but it's more, this is a heart level stuff. It's a willingness to to surrender or sacrifice our best uh, would, would be a way to kind of paraphrase that. Um, ready for battle, um, those lines moved somehow, but here's what I wanted to underscore there. They were tra able to travel by day and night, um, especially when they went in the wilderness, the cloud was giving them covering from the heat in the sun. And then at the nighttime, they probably were traveling more in, in the cool uh, of the night, uh, the light, uh, the, the pillar of fire, okay? The cloud by day, pillar of fire. So, so this was 
it, again, we don't know exactly what this looked like, but there was a cloud that was now uh, with them and would not leave them. And leading, um, in the case of need for defense, behind, move behind to defend against the uh, Egyptian army, uh, this cloud was with them. This cloud we're going to see in a moment was the was not just some apparition to kind of freak people out or whatever to just provide like a, a giant nightlight. It was the what we'll see is it was the presence of God. The presence of God was manifest in, in this cloud and, and this fire that would turn to a pillar of fire at night. Okay, important detail. Um, next reader, please. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piharoth between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with, them, with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots in Egypt with officers all of, over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they encamped by the sea, near pi ha up opposite Baal-Zephon. Great job with some tough names there. Um... Let's move to the next portion. And next reader, please. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry, dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to briefly comment there. Um, the, the people were in general freaking out and, and, and I think understandably so. Even though they had just seen some kind of miraculous signs and, and wonders and all of that, um, when you're hemmed in at the sea and you can't swim across and there's a, 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 a raiding kind of army coming back angry to either kill you, destroy you, or take you back captive, even worse conditions back to Egypt. You, understandably, the people were like, there's just nowhere to go. And, and you know, we're like, I think a very understandable response and reaction, right? Um, and another reader, is there someone else to go? Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. 
the Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Awesome. Thank you. Unless we miss this, um, the presence of God, the Lord himself, and we're going to look and kind of consider the, uh, yeah, break that down a little further in a moment, was protecting, defending, and we will see, you know, kind of fighting for um, taking out in a moment the, uh, the Egyptian army. Let me also just briefly comment that um, the, the narrative, the, the way the, the words used, the, the, there is no doubt in that the, the Hebrews believe, that the Israelites believe that, that the sea was parted and, and what was recorded here was miraculous. Um, there have been some attempts by those, especially some modern scholars, to suggest that it wasn't all that miraculous. Um, I believe it was miraculous. And, and this is one of, there are a, a number of signs and wonders that, um, we don't have time for this tonight, but, but that's a, such an important question, I think, when we think about what should we expect today? Do we pray ever for miracles or, or should we expect anything out of the ordinary? And I would say, based that, that we're talking about foundational kind of uh, template material here, that the Lord still works miracles and still does some crazy things sometimes. And there are parts of the world that don't have any trouble accepting that, probably a little more than, than our parts or my part. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a topic maybe for another day, or, or I, I might throw some material out um, in a follow-up kind of email. But uh, the, the, the story says that the yeah, God used a, a strong east wind all night long, but the, the sea was miraculous part. And somehow the people were able to cross, it says dry land, it literally says that, able not get bogged down in their feet to sink in the mud, uh, but the, uh, the pursuing army did not have such favor. Um, I think this is the last, just about the last portion here. An another reader, please. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived, but the Israelites went through the sea. Yeah, went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Thank you for that. And underscore here, if there's a, a summary sentence, or one that perhaps is the most important part of this portion of the, the Exodus story, it's this. The people were persuaded, right, by, by what God did. Moses, sure, he, he lifted his hands. He, he was the, uh, uh, an instrument in God's hand, but, but Moses was not parting the Red Sea, right, or the Sea of Reeds. Um, but the people understood through that, those experiences that God was to be feared judgment was met up, you know, kind of right in front of their eyes, you, you know, and, and, you know, all of us are endowed with some sense of justice. So, so there was this sense that justice was done. Human beings paid that price right in front of their eyes, jarring, and they put their trust in God that he was to be, was going to protect them and lead them. And, and suddenly they were free. And I don't think, you know, I think it's impossible for us to, to fully comprehend what suddenly they were free felt like. <laughs> but suddenly, um, this threat, you know, this, this overlord, this, uh, this kind of tyrannical kind of the, the pharaoh, and the pharaoh appears was with his army and was drowned, right? So was gone. Um, and so wanted to, um, before we kind of come back together and talk a little further, 
Uh, well, actually, there's uh, chapter 15 is is uh, just a, a, a large song or psalm uh, that they sang, of course, spontaneously there uh, in celebration that they were free. Um, if we could, I wish we could have seen the energy there. There was some energy here. Um, almost certainly, I'll read it quickly. Then Moses, the Israelites, sang this song to the Lord. And this is just little portions and highlights. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength, my defense. He's become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And these, this, the word there is Yahweh. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, had hurled, he hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers drowned in the, the Red Sea. The deep waters that covered them, they sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, has, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. And the nations did hear this story and they trembled. And it was a, a way that the way was paved in some measure because of, of the parting of the Red Sea, the, the destruction of the, the uh, Egyptian army, that, that that word got out and, and the other nations were like, God must be with them, right? Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse driver is hurled into the sea. And that's the end of our passage. I want to um, keep going here for a moment. Uh, another wonderful painting there of a, a terrible and kind of awesome event. <clears throat> um, uh, something happened there to push that down a little bit, but here's a couple of New Testament passages I want to consider with you and we transition to a last thought before kind of open it up. Hopefully I have some minutes for some questions and Q&A. And he, and this is um, when, after Jesus rose from the dead, uh, there were disciples walking along, some of you familiar with the story, uh, and they're talking with one another, and they were kind of mourning what had happened. Jesus was dead and, and all that. And he, Jesus said to them, he, he showed up. They did not recognize him. Interesting. Um, Cleopas, another unnamed disciple, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus revisited these stories and, and spoke about his participation in these stories. You know, there's something that, that happens, I think, when we're, we're new students to the scriptures, it certainly happened to me. First thing that happens generally is when I read the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, the New Testament, I go, are these the same gods? They seem a little, you know, is there a difference there? That's a very common response when we have a surface read and an initial read. But when you read more deeply and closely, you see, yes, it's the same. Here's another thing that I think happens when as believers is that when we sometimes, sometimes kind of ignore the Old Testament, right? Is that it's all Jesus all the time. And, and we think, well, why didn't Jesus show up until the second half? Like, why wasn't, you know, if you're in the baseball, why didn't he, why was it, why was he a pinch hitter in the seventh inning when, when, and he took over the game in the seventh inning, but why wasn't he in the first six innings? Here's, here's the, the point I want to simply make in looking at these passages and, and thinking on this a little bit is Jesus was in the, at the Exodus. Jesus was there. And, and I, there's a, um, whenever it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, I think there's like 65 times when it says angel of the Lord. And, and there's like uh, 200 some times when it says angel, right? And then 65 of them are angel of the Lord. Now, an angel, of course, is another uh, uh, created being, a creature that serves God. And, and angel, by the way, means messenger of Yahweh, messenger of God. So there's angels and demons. We, we're, we're familiar somewhat with that concept, right? But there's also this figure called the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord is likely, most theologians agree, a, a theophany. It's a God showing up in, in some form to speak to humans in the Old Testament or a Christophany. It is very possible that the, when, G, when Moses encountered the burning bush and the Lord, the angel of the Lord was there speaking to him, 
first person, clearly not an angel, just a, a mere angel. This is the angel of the Lord. This was, that might have been Jesus speaking to Moses in the burning bush. In that exchange in chapter six, where Moses and, and the Lord go back and forth and the Lord, the angel, that's likely again, the angel of the Lord there in this kind of, in some way revealing in this very personal way to Moses, you know, this, this more direct kind of conversation, likely the angel of the Lord. And it, the, the text also suggests, and we'll see the, the New Testament writer reflect on this as well a bit, that the, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night was the presence of God. And, and it follows, right, this, the blood, the covering of the people for, you know, that they would not be destroyed um, by the, the destroying angel. Um, blood follows, and then this, the presence of God comes in chapter one, right, in, in the story of God's people. Guess where else the, the presence of God descends in a unique and new way in the new covenant, right? The day of Pentecost after Jesus blood shed, the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, right? The, the price paid, faith now opened up in this new way, relationship with God more intimate because the Holy Spirit given. So this is either like uh, some member of the Trinity, right? And the, the, this maybe Jesus, probably Jesus, maybe just the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, but key here, right? Then and key now is that the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, wants to, to lead his people. There is no question whatsoever about that. Uh, Jude, now I want to remind you, although you once knew that Jesus who saved his people, out, Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Jesus was there, okay? Just again, this might be like, well, yeah, of course. Or it might be like, oh yeah, of course, right? There's a... Jesus was present throughout uh, human history and, and in some measure at that time, right? Um, everything was pointing to this coming Messiah, the, the first and second coming of Jesus. But Jesus was in a sense, God manifest, sure, but in somewhat in disguise, kind of like he was with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. First Corinthians 10, this is a very key passage for us tonight. For I do not want you to be unaware, but this is a reference to Exodus, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased and it goes on. I'll come back to the second half of the prayer. That, that first portion, right, is there's, there's language that's used that like the people of God were in some way baptized into, the, into Moses, the deliverer, right? He was the deliverer of the, the Israelites at that time, the, the key figure, God revealing, working through, they were baptized with him. Remember the other occurrence of the, the word reeds in Exodus, of course? was Moses was pulled from the water, the reeds along the bank of the river, right, and saved. Um, that salvation story for Moses to have life, to begin with, all the people of God followed in the same way, that same salvation story through the water in this case, spared from drowning in the sea, right? They were, um, instead, they were brought safely through the sea, and, and in that way, they were baptized into Moses. There's also a reference in a moment about being baptized into Christ. So you see the parallels, right? You see the, the, the mirror kind of uh, imagery. Here's one thing, that, one takeaway, a practical one. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to, to finish up here. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. This is the first Corinthians 10 passage. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to men. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with a temptation, he will provide the way of escape, like through the Red Sea, right? That you may be able to endure it. Connected to that wonderful promise where God will meet us and provide for us when we are tempted. This is where um, some of, many of us, right? All of us, I think we're, we're obviously not um, slaves as the Egyptians are, the, the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. So we're not slaves in that way, though freedom came, 
thank God whenever that, that comes in that way. But what do we have in common with the people of Israel and the Egyptians and every other tribe on the earth? What we have in common moving into Romans material is that we're all enslaved to sin. And that's the language that, that Paul uses explicitly right in Romans 6. We're gonna look, finish up with that. We are enslaved to sin. We, we need the, the salvation for us all is deliverance, right? From bearing the, the penalty for our own sin, being covered by the blood of Jesus, which is what happens when we put our faith and trust in him. And, and being freed from not only doom and the, the, from, from death and a second death, a spiritual one, but freed from the power of sin. Right? If there's one pretty obvious application point here, I think we can take from the, the, this portion of the Exodus story, it is that the power of sin has been broken and drowned just like the Egyptian army on the sea. And, and it no longer has that kind of dominion and power over God's people. And that's a total amen. The power of sin, when I trusted Christ, was broken in me. It does not mean that I don't want to go back to Egypt sometimes, as we'll see the Israelites saying, I think we should go back to Egypt. Foolish. Uh, but sometimes we go back to Egypt. Um, but it means that the power of sin has been broken in our lives and that, that there's a Red Sea that will part in any situation that we can have safe exit and, and deliverance. I think that's a fair uh, or an appropriate kind of application uh, of the story. And then let me finish here with this passage. What shall we say then? Or you continue to sin that grace may abound by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? What does that mean? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. <clears throat> so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Our baptism now, right, as believers is with Christ, it's in Christ, we're baptized into his death which means that, that it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's a way of saying that we um, have the ability with his grace and power to put to death uh, the old way and the, the old nature and the sin that used to dominate us and to put on his righteousness and to live in this new way. And um, that, I'll stop that share. Okay. Um, All right, it's, it's, we just have a few minutes left. Um, that went a little longer than I, I thought, but I would love to, there might be time to feel at least a question or two or three. Um, Thanks, Don. I, that part was, the ending was really cool. I feel like just the fact that we, we have died to the power of sin, but that doesn't mean we don't want to go back to Egypt. Like that, I think it's a, it's a very applicable thing. Um, so thank you, Don, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So I'll start with this one. Did Joseph know the Israelites would be running from slavery and oppression when he told his descendants that God would come from the, come for them and that they should take his bones with them? Yeah, I believe that Joseph, um, obviously you don't know a great deal of detail, but this, this is a prophetic kind of thing. Um, in some way, Joseph, um, a savior figure, right? Um, spared a multitude from uh, droughts and, and starvation. Um, God used horrible events in his life, right, to lead, to position him in, in that place, right, in Egypt. Um, but in some way, I believe that God um, gave him a, a, a vision of what was to come, become of, or, or come of, of God's people. And 
a lot of times prophecies, at least for us, if, if receiving them, people receive them are a bit vague, but uh, Joseph clearly understood enough from this prophetic word and was confident enough in it to say, please take me along, <laughs> carry my bones, please, into the end. And so um, I, I just see this, uh, the, the Old Testament is just filled with, I think some count like 500 messianic prophecies, right? Jesus filled 65 specific ones, right? So there's there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament, and I believe this is just simply another one. Great, thanks, Don. That's that's super interesting. It's it's so cool to see how this all fits in. Um, and adding on to that, another really cool question: Do we know historically what impact the episode with the Israelites had on the faith of Egyptians and future Christianity in Egypt? Um, I don't know if Fetty might be able to answer that better or Renee. Um, I cannot, I, I know that um, I, I'm blanking on which disciple or maybe plural disciples traveled into Africa, but the, the disciples of 12, right, plus scattered, I mean, they went all directions and they carried the gospel with them. So I, I know that Egypt was a, an earlier first stop, and um, there's a strong tradition. I know that much uh, throughout uh, Egypt's history of faith, and and Fetty and Renee are, are local experts for sure. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Sorry, I can't answer that better. Good. Um, maybe we can we can ask Fetty if he's on here next time about that. And it looks like we have one more question. Is there a connection between the pillar of fire leading the Israelites day and night and Christians slash believers in Christ receiving and being led by the Holy Spirit daily, our daily unleavened bread? I, I really, I believe so. I mean, that was the first thing as I revisited the story and, and just have been meditating on some more. I believe there's a, a, a complete parallel there. Um, what's what's fascinating about the Israel's history, right, is that that God wanted to lead them, and and be their Lord, right, like to 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 govern and to to lead through through prophets and 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 the people, of course, struggled mightily along the way and really weren't coming along for the ride more often than not. <clears throat> but it was not God's design, right, for human kings. Uh, the the people insisted on it. Right. And so I think there's a, to me, uh, Israel fell short overall, right, in their uh, following of, of this God, Yahweh. Um, and uh, yeah, the old covenant is, portions are rather depressing because the, the people are constantly being called back, called back. In, in the that account where I read from Nehemiah, um, rebuilding, right? Uh, bringing people back, rebuilding, uh, re-engaging with the, the practices of worship, observing, remembering, worshiping together, right? Um, the, a lot of repentance had to happen in that moment when that we were recounting the story, uh, calling people to repent again and, and to come back online. Um, but, but I believe that that it's absolutely a picture from from the get-go, right? That God wanted to to lead and guide and protect and provide for um, his people. Um, so, yes. Great. Thanks, Don, actually, can I, can I add there real quick? Sure. Just briefly, I was just going to say, I, I don't think that the symbolism of a pillar of fire and then the Holy Spirit descending in Acts with tongues of fire, that's not an accident, no. for sure. Um, so just wanna draw people's attention to like that kind of symbolism in the scripture. It's, there are always these images that are kind of playing with each other between the Old and New Testament. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for that, Tyler. Uh, there absolutely is, and, and that's the fun, right? As you uh, continue to study the scriptures, you see these threads and, um, and some of them are pretty prominent. We're just about out of time. Um, let me pray for us. And yeah, just really good to see you all tonight. Um, Father, we um, 
are so grateful that we have access to these stories, um, that we can join the multitude over time that have really uh, learned, heard these stories, um, incorporated them into their their lives and their understanding of you. And Lord, we're happy to join that kind of throng of people and uh, where we continue to pray and ask, what would you have us uh, learn from these stories? Uh, what should we um, take away? Uh, what applies today? What truths and, and principles? Um, Lord Jesus, what does it mean that you... Uh, yeah, what, what does this mean uh, in, in our own lives that you are uh, someone that we can uh, turn to and cry out to? Um, and Lord, we, we pray for ourselves and for each other that you would um, strengthen us uh, by your Holy Spirit to, to resist temptation. Um, that's something that's ongoing for all of us and, and very real. Uh, we pray that um, we would uh, avail ourselves of the exit door, um, if especially for any of us, any of those here that are struggling with a recurring kind of sin or, or feel even in some ways kind of enslaved to something. Lord, would you, um, by your grace, um, in your grace, uh, meet us where we are. Pray that your, um, uh, your power would be manifest as we um, resist sin and as we humble ourselves and as we um, determine to uh, walk closely with you. I pray for any that feel uh, kind of beaten up uh, tonight in their uh, struggle and, and battle with sin, uh, that you would encourage them and strengthen them. And, and Lord, we pray for some of those small victories, those daily kind of victories in, in various struggles that we have. Um, and we need your strength and grace. And Lord, we want to uh, live as those that, uh, yeah, are, are free, uh, free in you, free to follow you, free to um, happily um, grow in our understanding of your commandments and your ways and, and happily obey. Uh, so Lord, would you continue to bless this study this summer, um, continue to meet us uh, right where we are and continue to show us uh, yourself. And uh, we pray all this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Don, for such a great talk. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see all your faces and we will see you again next week. Um, hopefully before that, but if not next week, week five, another awesome Bible course lesson coming your way. So thanks again, Don. Everyone have a great evening. Awesome. See you after every one more time.